Senator Rosen, you're recognized for your questions. Thank you, Chair Peters. Thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Appreciate that. I'm gonna talk a little bit about university research because Nevada universities, well, they're doing cutting edge biological research, including work focused on viruses. Our university scientists are leading the way on everything from studying how monoclonal antibodies could be used to detect and treat Ebola, or how to boost the body's own immune system to kill virally infected cells and many other areas of critical, critical medical research. So Dr. Parker, as a university researcher, you understand both the importance of the work that's being conducted in research labs and the challenges universities face from a security perspective when dealing with serious viruses. So what recommendations do you have for us here in Congress on additional technical assistance or grant funding that might be used for university labs to do this life-saving work on breakthrough research and making sure we're doing it in the safest way possible? Sure, thank you um, for the question and um, the uh, comments about the importance of our university uh, research enterprise across the United States. It absolutely is, um, it is essential. And the vast majority of the the research that is conducted in our, in our universities and the research that you talked about that may involve working with hazardous pathogens does not cross into this lane of what I call the DERC PEP, you were, um, the new dual use research concern and the um, pathogens with enhanced pandemic potential. So the vast majority doesn't even get into that lane, but nonetheless, uh, the new policy though, it gives, a lot of responsibility to our principal investigators and research institutions, and they have the primary responsibility now to flag, identify whether their research may cross into that, that lane. And so to, I'm gonna go now to implementation of this new Dirk PEP policy. Um, they're gonna have to have a lot of help. This does actually put a lot of additional responsibilities, and those responsibilities will come with accountability, and uh, they will need to have a lot of help from the federal funding agencies and departments, mm -hmm. um, and they're gonna have to have resources. And so the, and, and they're gonna have to have congressional help uh, to ensure that uh, those things happen. Um, but again, I wanna say, emphasize that the vast majority of our university in, enterprise does not cross into that, but we wanna make sure they don't. Well, I wanna build on that a little bit because of course with the advent of artificial intelligence and virtual modeling, we're maybe able to um, avoid some of these uh, safety issues or get around them or make things safer because we use the intelligent, artificial intelligence. We're able to use the virtual modeling. We're able to do um, multiple iterations and generations of uh, research just by computing power. And so predictive analytics are going to continue to advance. Technology is going to play a larger role in this research. And I think it's going to bring new opportunities and hopefully it will minimize, not all the risks, you still have to do other things, but possibly minimize those risks. Um, so Dr. Bolinets, can throughout your career, um, how is the integration of technology been integrated into the lab? Uh, how has it changed the work that you've done? And what new vulnerabilities does it open up for you? In, uh, maybe instead of having the actual virus, but now you may have cyber attacks. Thank you, Senator Rosen. I think you're asking exactly the right questions that we need to be thinking about. As science evolves, as technology evolves, it's always important to think about how that moving landscape alters our assessment of benefit and risk in real time as best as we can, noting that it's evolving technology and we don't always know where it's going to go. I, you know, I, and, and so that I think speaks as to the need for both flexible uh, policy frameworks to be able to make those risk and benefit assessments among that moving landscape, but, but also the importance of the fundamental knowledge about viruses that allow us to move into this space of mm -hmm. um, using maybe alternative methods like computation in a way that might be safer than handling actual viruses. Right, right now, our computational tools, they're getting better, but they're not great at, con at predicting phenotype of the virus from genotype. And so studying, the more we study viruses, the better those tools will get, and then we do need to think about the cybersecurity and, and right. information risks. Well, of course, as you get more information, artificial intelligence, just like anyone, it gets better by the input. So the more you give it, the better it's going to learn. But I do think that um, 
you talk about balancing risk. I'm going to follow up with you as well. I'm going to go on uh, to Dr. Parker and again, Dr. Willenitz. Uh, is that scientific research always carries risk? We know that. Risk and reward. We hope we cure things, right? And so some of that risk is the actual research. It's the proper safety protocol, containment, and control of information as we discussed with cybersecurity. But not pursuing critical research. It also carries a risk that can be fatal because that means we're not going to be prepared for eventuality or potentiality of something happening. And so we want to be able to have treatments or understanding as we move forward against either existing viruses or future variants. So what do you see the best way, I'll start with Dr. Parker and then we'll go to Dr. Relenitz, the best way to balance uh, being prepared for the next serious viral outbreak, such as a drug-resistant strain of tuberculosis maybe becoming airborne, or just whatever those needs are to prevent um, any risk from happening? Sure. Well, first, we have to understand what's happening, and that means we have to have public health surveillance, animal health surveillance, uh, so we understand what is in our environment, what may be coming our way. That doesn't mean we go to the laboratory and create a novel virus, though. So we have to understand... The state is sharing between countries, between labs, about what you're well, finding in, on the field, we have right? To have, we have to have uh, international collaboration, and there are smart ways to do interna international collaboration, and, and we need to pursue those things. And, and uh, so first is what's in our environment. And then second, we also have to have the re strong research and development platform, thinking about the vaccine candidates that we need to be preparing for and how those would move into advanced development and manufacturing. And, and, and we don't have the capability to to uh, do that strong advanced development and manufacturing if, if uh, bird flu, in fact, were to right. start infecting humans tomorrow. Think and about so the we, supply chain. And all the supply yeah. chains, everything is associated with that. But all that does not involve, necessarily does not need us to develop especially dangerous, pandemic-capable viruses in the laboratory to do what I just said. Right. Thank you. Would you like to finish for a second here? Yes, yeah, so I'll just quickly add that um, there is a lot more that we don't know about the world around us than that we do know. And so it is important to consider asking those questions. We wouldn't do the science if we knew the answers. So there is always going to be some measure of unpredictability in terms of being able to gauge both the benefit and the risk of any given research project. Mm -hmm. And particularly when you're talking about projects involving pathogens. However, um, we uh, uh, are, as we know, that fundamental knowledge feeds back into our risk-benefit equation um, in a way that makes it better as we go. And I strongly support Dr. Parker's earlier recommendation that if we invest in applied biosafety and biosecurity research to really fundamentally understand what methodologies and procedures can actually improve our safety and security, the better off we will be in managing those risks. Thank you very much. I yield back. I've heard each of our witnesses uh, use terms uh, gain of function, high risk research, uh, 